Well, good frigid evening, St. Germain, Northland Community of Faith. We're glad you're here. Psalm 122, uh, verses 1 and 2 starts, I rejoiced when I heard them say, let us go to God's house. Now, whether it's the temple, as that particular passage is talking about, or the church, the point isn't the place. The point is that God wanted his people together and gave them a place, the temple in those days, the church in these days, to gather, to be encouraged and to encourage. And we are excited that you're here. Tons of things God is doing to encourage us as a local body. Keep in mind that uh, the final weekend for returning the baby bottles full of your pennies, nickels, and dimes, and quarters uh, is this weekend. So if you have that, Please drop it off in the back. Uh, It does a tremendous amount of work here in the local area uh, for those women that find themselves in a crisis pregnancy center or crisis pregnancy and need our help. So your generosity is incredibly appreciated. Also, the final weekend for making changes or adding your names to our directory. We want as many people as possible to be able to connect with one another through phone, email, whatever. Uh, You'll see a sample directory out there if your name is in there. Make sure the information is correct. If you're not in there and want to be in there, please uh, let us know. We've got a form that you can fill out and get your name in there. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Also, we're putting together a a medical team. Uh, Just our security team wants to make sure that as we worship, we are safe. They're doing all kinds of things to help that happen. If you are a medical person of any kind, we'd like to know. So if we have a need, uh, we hope it never happens, but if we have a medical need in the course of being here gathered together, then we would know who to contact. The hope is to have somebody at every worship service identified as a person who can help out in that way. Please sign up at the Welcome Center, or if you know Mike Sealander, uh, just mention that you are interested in doing that. Uh, super exciting announcement. We're going to have a special business meeting. Now I know business meetings are not all that exciting, right? Well, this one is uh, in two, uh, two weeks on both Saturday and Sunday, February 20th and 21st. We are going to vote as to whether or not to pay off our mortgage. Okay, does that even need a vote? It's like we could do, do let's pay off the mortgage, okay? So, been decided. But if you are a member and have an email, uh, you will have already gotten information about that. There's also information at the Welcome Center. It's one of those things that uh, God has supernaturally done in uh, for uh, three-ish years, pay off that kind of mortgage in this incredible facility we have. God has been good. And we want to confirm that and say thank you to him by paying it off and being done with the mortgage being mortgage-free, so we can use those funds for his good or his glory and the good of this church. So uh, please be in attendance if you can. Uh, I'm assuming we'll be videotaping it like we did the last time. It'll be online so you can watch it. You'll have all kinds of ways of voting, and those are made known in the email we sent, or uh, just let us know and we'll let you know uh, how to do that, how to vote. Finally, Easter is on the way. Crazy, huh? Lent begins in a week. So we want to have uh, uh, every opportunity for you to celebrate as we prepare for that Easter season. Zach, our worship pastor, has written some guidelines. You'll find those on a yellow sheet in your bulletin. And we also have Lent devotionals, something that you can uh, take a look at and that we as a church in community can kind of be working through the same scripture verses, the same passages, the same prayers as we prepare for the Easter season. So please feel free to take one of those. Now I'd like to invite Pastor Josh up with another exciting announcement. Uh, Not so much an announcement. Uh, We're going to continue in worship. And one of the ways that we worship is to connect. And so we're just going to connect in a new way right now. Again, if you're new, um, one of the things that we like to do as a church is to highlight missionaries. Uh, We've been able, kind of privileged to have every single one of our missionaries visit personally our church, whether they're on the other side of the globe or not. 
Um, and so we want to highlight how we are supporting and committed to the global ministry of going out into the world and making friendships and, and establishing relationships that shine the gospel. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in Luke 10, 9, it talked about the ministry of going out is a ministry of healing and of sharing the news that the kingdom of God is near. That's really what we're about. So uh, every year we continue to prayerfully expand in kind of who we partner with as missionaries. And this year, Lloyd and Mary Wapp uh, are missionaries that we have committed to support. They're new to us, but not new to missions. So why don't you come up? Lloyd and Mary and their daughter Lydia are here. Um, so a little bit about them as they come up. Uh, first of all, it's the first time I've seen them without a mask on. So good to meet you, like uh, face to face. Um, just had a lovely time chatting with you on the phone and getting to know you um, as a family and praying with you. Uh, they have been in ministry in the Philippines for over 20 years. Uh, their home base has been Wisconsin. And they came home to be home for like a short period of time, a little less than a year maybe or in that range. And then COVID hit. And so they kind of been a little stuck. Um, so I guess my question is uh, just... What's a little bit of your background? Give us some of the backstory to getting to where you're at today in ministry in the Philippines. Okay. Um, we went to the Philippines in 98, but be previous to that, um, we were a young couple, um, and we had a truck farm or a vegetable farm. And uh, when we, we had training through Ethnos 360 or or New Tribes Mission, and we hit, got to the field, and uh, we wanted to get into a tribal location to be able to teach God's Word, and we, to do that, you have to learn their language and their culture, and that's a major part of what we did, and um, as time went on, we were able to be allocated into a tribe among the Mandaya people, and um, would you like to say... Mm -hmm. So, okay, so just a couple follow-up questions. And yeah, I'd love to hear from Mary. So, uh, like, <laughs> farmer, <laughs> right. farmers in southwest Wisconsin? Southeast? Southeast. Yeah. Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, and you went to study uh, missions uh, at the age of what? 35. 35. So, total vocational shift. And sold your farm? Yes. And uh, received the training and then moved in 90... 98. 98 to the yeah. Philippines. Wow. All right. So yeah. maybe, I guess, Mary, explain to us just a little bit of where you are right now. What's your purpose maybe in ministry as a whole? Well, um, I think Lloyd does better at this one than I do, but... Um, our purpose really is to get the Word of God in the hands of the Mandaya people group in the Philippines, and not only to get it into their hands, but to have them actually be able to study for themselves the Word of God. So we really are um, like pushing, learning, trying to get materials to them to learn how to read better so that they can actually study the Word for themselves. Awesome. So you are learning a language, have learned it, in order to be able to teach the written portion and the reading portion of that language to the people that you learned it from, basically. Yeah, that's correct. And when we first went there, they told us, you can't write our language down. Nobody's ever been able to write this. Wow. And so you developed the, lang the written language? Yes, we did. Holy moly. Okay. So farming and developing a written language that's never been written before. You know, really, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, Lloyd, what is your passion in doing this? What gets you excited about this ministry? Uh, when I be able to see somebody that you're discipling, learn how to actually uh, share with someone else and then disciple them. That is actually a really, really uh, cool thing to see, the Lord working in somebody's heart and mind. Um, it was very, um, like it hit my heart really hard in the sense of, seeing where some of the people came from. Uh, recently, one of the kids, uh, him and his dad were walking, and they 
<clears throat> came upon a durian tree. It grows these huge fruits with spikes on them, but the durian falls off the tree. And they're like, oh, they love that stuff. So they, they went to go get it, and, they, and the son said, hey, no, you know. And dad said kind of like, well, we can just tell them later that we got it. But he said, no, we should really ask permission for it. In the past, they would have just took it and said, well, we'll tell them in the future, but, <laughs> and never tell them. And in this case, he went and asked. And um, to see that kind of, and, and the reason why he did that was because he's like, I don't want to uh, do anything, offend the Lord. And, um, and it was just a big change in people's hearts when they actually come to the Lord uh, instead of possibly hearing young people saying how much they hated somebody or, or wanted to kill someone or something like that with the conversation and, and the change in their hearts and their minds. Um, I feel like just, I mean, we could be here for two hours and still wouldn't do justice to the work of 20 years of investing in a community and being able to see lives change. So I'm grateful to the Lord for the time you've spent there. Quick question for Lydia, and then I got a question for Mary. Lydia, what do you miss the most right now? The food and also my friends that are in the Philippines. And you were born in the Philippines? Yes, I was. Oh, man. So you're getting ready to get home. What's your favorite dish? Like, what do you, what do you miss the most? Pansing Canton. Oh, I love that. I love that. That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Um, it's similar to the Chinese food that's lo mein. And the Filipinos usually eat it during, it's sort of like their party food. Like, yeah. they eat it during birthday parties yeah. and special celebrations. Yeah, anything you eat during your birthday party, special celebrations, food I want to eat. So... Um, okay, so I have a question. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, and I have a question for you, Mary, and then we're going to pray. But would you read us, and I gave her a little bit of preparation. I just want to hear, if you can, John 3.16 in Mendiah. I, and why are you laughing? <laughs> because she totally doesn't know the language? or be, No. And, Can you tell her that she's the translator from Scripture? Ah. So that's why she's doing this. Ah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't think they heard you, though. So, yeah. No, no. So okay. I just wanted to hear, I wanted to hear a scripture in the language that you spend time in. You know? Okay. Okay. Um, this is John 3.16, but it actually, some, they have some Spanish connection there. So some of the words sound similar to Spanish. Paria San Juan, capítulo 3, versículo 16. Sigue? Ala. Nga. Mangyari kaya kayo gunan gayod ng tagalang yung kamangautuan ani sang kalibutan amo kay yagatag yan sang kanan tamisa na iso kay para sang di sang sino na utaw na motulo kanan dili dayan magalaglag inon makaangkon dahil silan ng kinabuy na magadadayaw na way kinatuban. Amen. Amo yan yung Juan. Capitolo 3, J.C. Sykes. Mm, amen. That is a product of a life's like investment in a community, in my opinion. Mary, is just that you two and you three, just this is your home. And these are your people and you love them and you miss them. And so I would just encourage you to be praying for the WAPs. And um, we just want to pray for them now. They've got a table set up. There's so much more we could go into. So many more stories. But we just want to pray for you. Um, what is, uh, before I pray, what are a couple of things that very specifically we could be praying for? Well, we really need to, uh, uh, some, some uh, what is it, paperwork or government papers to be able to get back into the Philippines. And we'll probably also get, have to get the, the COVID shot and have documentation of that. And uh, so we've, we want to get it back, hopefully by June or July. Okay. Yeah. By June or July this, this year, mm -hmm. the paperwork, any of the COVID vaccination issues, you want to get those taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay. For Lydia and I, it's definitely our hearts kind of break. Still being here? Yeah. And then I think um, for Lloyd, though he didn't say this, he really has a heart that the believers there say stay strong in the Lord yeah. and that they continue to share um, what they have learned 
with others and they continue to grow in the Lord. Yeah. You guys miss being there. You yes. miss being there. All right, let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for Mary and Lloyd and for Lydia and for their heart. Lord, we, uh, we have just, just, we're at the very beginning of connecting with them as a church and a community. And uh, I, I just, Lord, I feel inadequate to kind of be able to put on display all the goodness uh, that you've shown them, but we, we trust that that's there. We know that's there as you have allowed them to invest in this community, the Mendiah people, getting to know the language. And so I just lift them up to you. I pray that you would encourage their hearts. Uh, we talked before about how they're staying connected um, online with their friends there. And I pray that those connections yield fruit, that they can continue to pray for and be encouraged both ways. And I pray that you would allow all of the the details to be taken care of, for the paperwork to go through, for the vaccines to be able to take place and for the documentation just to all work. I pray in the name of Jesus that it works even sooner than they would expect and be able to move forward um, and that you would get the glory for that. So Lord, as we pray and worship together now as a community, uh, may we just show you gratitude and thanks for being able to spend time together and um, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. A great family, great couple. Thank you for sharing your hearts. Connect with them afterwards, all right? Welcome. All right, let's stand. Would you stand up and let's worship the Lord together in song?
Yeah. 
is greater than yours, so strong that you can just burst out of a grave like nothing. Lord, we just recognize that that power is available to us uh, through your spirit and through your presence in our lives, through the redemption, the rework you've done in our hearts, Lord. Um, we have access to your power. Um, so Lord, I just pray that you would just remind us of um, how much we need you day to day, minute by minute, how much we need you and how much we should be relying on you and your strength in all things. Lord, I pray for us as we turn to um, this table of communion that you would give us a piece of that strength, um, remind us of the hope that we have, the security we have, um, the grace and the hope and the love that we have through what Christ has done on the cross for us. So Lord, please let this be a, a savorful time around this table. Prepare our hearts now. We give you this night in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may have a seat. We enter now a time of communion, worship through communion. I was standing here before I came up, and I was kind of thinking back in my life to more memorable communion moments. Like if you had to pull out of your memory what a more memorable commun communion moment was in your life, uh, what would that be? Uh, I was thinking of a time where we took communion before camp started in uh, Alaska, Unalakleet, Alaska. And we had prepared and the kids were coming the next day, but we paused and we had a time of communion. Um, what, I would love to hear those stories. I'd love to hear the stories of uh, your memory, why the moment of communion was important for you or you remember it or it sticks out in your memory. Good or bad. Maybe there's a bad, you know, experience kind of that you were growing through or that something happened. But uh, um, communion times are anchor points in the monthly, weekly, ongoing life of the church. And so a couple of things at the beginning of our time. First of all, we recognize we are still connecting with people who are connecting online. And so you can totally take communion with us, but you just need to get your own elements it means you need to get some bread or crackers to represent the body of Christ and some juice or wine or water to represent the blood of Christ. I've said this throughout the pandemic that those taking care with those elements is important, being reverent, being careful, but ultimately it's not the elements themselves. They symbolize something greater. It's the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that we remember in this time. So that's the first thing. Second thing, it's really natural for us to want to worship through giving. And for so many years, the pattern is we, we remember Christ in communion, and then we pass the plates, and we worship through giving. So we're not passing plates. We've got these offering boxes, and you can give online. But a reminder that on communion weeks, we also receive and take and ask for um, offerings toward our benevolence fund. And that goes to help those in our community in need get from one kind of a bridge time, from one difficult point to, to kind of through that into a time of, of healing. Um, and we really seek to steward that well. So you can mark that with a little envelope there by the, the offering boxes if you want to give to the Benevolence Fund or online, you can mark it as Benevolence. So those are a couple of details with those kind of behind us, we enter now into worship through communion. And in a moment, what I want to do is um, I want to simply extend an invitation to you. And then I want to read an acclamation of praise. And then I want to pray first silently and then the Lord's Prayer. And then we'll take communion. Here's the invitation. Congregation of Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared this table for all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation. All who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord, are invited to partake with gladness 
in the table of the Lord. The gifts of God for the people of God. Here's the acclamation of praise from Psalm 103 in Revelation 5. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Would you bow your heads with me in a time of silent prayer? Heavenly Father, your love is great. We are amazed again at how you planned before even the creation of the world to save us. And we look to this time now, remembering your son and praying to you the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now for those present, you can take your uh, communion elements and uh, prepare the, unwrap them and find the little wafer. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks to the Lord, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now take the cup. In the same way, After supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. Would you pray again with me? Heavenly Father, gracious God, loving creator, you've put gladness in our hearts. You've satisfied our hunger with good things. In giving all, you have not held back from us your own dear son. How can we hold back anything from you, our Lord and our God? Renew us day by day with the gift of your Spirit and prepare us now for this time in your Word. May we give ourselves completely to your service. May we walk with joy in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Well, if you've got a Bible, turn with me, please, to Luke 11. We have been going through the book of Luke since the summer of last year. We're in Luke 11, verses um, 14 to 54, kind of the outside brackets of where we're going to be. But I want to read at the start uh, Luke 11, verses 29 to 36. So if you get there, if you have a Bible, whether or not you do or not, if you are able, please stand with me uh, just out of respect for God's word as I read Luke eleven twenty nine 29 to 36. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, Something greater than Jonah is here. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Thanks to the Lord for this, his word. You can have a seat. I love this. This is the time I look forward to every week. It's spending time with you and God's word and thinking together about what we see and I'm excited to to look at God's word with you. Back in the summer, it was probably July that we laid out this entire um, sermon series for a year. And as we laid it out, there were a couple principles, a few principles that kind of rose to the surface. The first was this, and it had to do with focus. We were in July, we were experiencing the racial tensions that were kind of really boiling to the surface in our country at that point. We had not yet gone through the elections. And I felt like the Lord was making it as clear as the nose on our face that we need to focus on the gospel of Luke and the person of Jesus as we go through this time. And that's the way we meet the questions that come out of uh, just a difficult world. Pain in our world. How do we address the pain in our world? How do we not lose kind of focus of what's going on in the world and understand how to live well in it, I felt like the Lord was saying, read Luke. <laughs> Stay in Luke. Just keep reading about Jesus in Luke. And the stories that you read will guide you as a people as you walk through this year. So that was, first of all, was focus. The second principle has to do with pace. Um, I feel like it's important to kind of move through Scripture at a decent pace. And so we laid out kind of a plan to get through Luke in a year. Now, a year is a long time, and it's not a long time. Uh, Philip Ryken is the president of Wheaton. He was a pastor. He wrote a commentary. I basically have used his commentary in every sermon uh, since we've been in, in Luke. But he split it up into 144, 112 divisions. So he spent the better part of two and a half years going through Luke. We could have done it that way. But I kind of felt like it was important to move through it a little bit at a more steady pace. Uh, Because if I'm in a long, like, epic novel for two years, and that takes me two years, I forget what happened at the beginning by the time I get to the end, you know, or a work of nonfiction or whatever. So I just felt like it was important for us to move through at a steady pace. The last principle was uh, to invite all of us to read this personally on our own. So we sell these little scripture uh, journals where like one part of the journal is the text and the other side is uh, just open page of notes. And we've sold a bunch of those. 
And the whole idea is no matter what pace we go, a half hour sermon just can't get us close to really getting down into and in between all of the words in there and behind what's there. And so go for it yourself. Get into the word, read it, spend some time talking about it with other people. And so those scripture journals were important. I just thought it was important as we look at this text today to be reminded of why we're doing what we're doing. And that'll be important as we get into the sermon a little bit more. But I'm basically kind of skimming over a number of verses and not addressing a number of other verses at the end as much in order to focus on this part right in the middle. And I would ask you to spend your own time studying some of that other part in more depth because of the pace at which we're moving through the book of Luke. But interestingly enough, I think these verses that we're going to focus on today speak directly into our world, into the back and forth of our political mess, into our sinful brokenness, into our deep need for Jesus. So let's dig in. Luke eleven twenty nine 29 to 32. Let's look at those verses first. Uh, this is the passage about Jonah, the people of Nineveh, uh, the queen of the south and King Solomon, this insatiable hunger that the followers of Christ had at the time for a sign. Um, it's about all those things and the, the person of Jesus then who is right in their midst among them. So at this point in Jesus' ministry, in verses 29 to 32, uh, he's getting closer and closer to the cross every day. We're closer in Jesus' ministry to the time of the cross and the, his death and resurrection and um, the end of his earthly ministry than we are to the beginning of his earthly ministry. And the religious establishment, the Pharisees, the elders, the teachers, the legal experts, they're all getting threatened. And the crowds are continuing to grow following Jesus, but now the opposition is really continuing to grow. Before this passage, in uh, kind of in between, last week I preached on a little bit of, uh, the theme was prayer, a little bit on the Lord's Prayer, the shorter version of the Lord's Prayer, and in through the end of verse 13. The verses 14 up to 30, uh, 29, where we're going to start, Basically, Jesus very publicly and clearly casts out a demon. But the miracle gets questioned by others who are demanding a more clear sign. Jesus responded with logic and reason, explaining that he was serving God, not the devil. He warned people that if they were not with him, they were against him. Then a woman cried out in verses 27 and 28 that blessed is uh, Jesus' mother. And he doesn't deny that, but he says, you know what? There's more blessing actually for the people who hear the word of God and keep it. And so what we have right before Jesus says these words, in other words, what we have is a lot of drama and a lot of division. A lot of drama and a lot of division. Does that sound familiar? Like if I was going to produce a five-part Ken Burns type series on our current situation in our world right now, I would call it drama and division. That's what I call it in our country. That's what it feels like to me. And so those were the times then too. And what Jesus is about to say, he uses this to speak into that drama and that division. That's what we hear. Listen again to verse 29. With that in mind, all this drama and division that's happening, this swell of uh, kind of following, but maybe being a little bit surfacey in their following, the swell of opposition into all this drama and division, this is what Jesus says in verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Sometimes Jesus' words were just really bold uh, and kind of in your face. And that's one of these, that's, this is one of those uh, times. There is a broken and sinful human tendency in all of us to one degree or another to want more from God. Like what I've seen is not enough. And we want it in a demanding and a selfish way that's more about us than it is about God. 
All of us to one degree or another have that inside of us, this brokenness. But here's the thing. People then and people today, we don't need more signs. We need to believe the signs we've already been given. Jesus is basically saying, I'm the sign. (laughs) You're asking for more signs, but my presence, my words, I'm the sign. I've worked. I am working. I will work powerfully. That's what he means when he mentions the sign of Jonah. Verse 30, for as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. This is where it's helpful to know our Bibles, to read some of the Old Testament uh, kind of regularly or to read through the Bible on a regular basis. Uh, Most of you probably know at least the outline of the story of Jonah and the whale. Jonah was the prophet that God had called to go preach to the rebellious and lost people of Nineveh. But in sinful rebellion, Jonah bought himself a one-way ticket in the total opposite direction And that's when God sent a great fish to swallow him alive. And then after three days underwater, the prophet repented. The fish vomited him back up onto the shore. And he went to Nineveh, where he warned the people that judgment was imminent. And then watched them repent of their sins. That's the Old Testament story, just in a nutshell. But what's the sign of Jonah? Well, there's a lot of parallels. Jonah and Jesus were both prophets. Jonah and Jesus both preached. But neither of those are really signs, like a miraculous sign. The miracle in the story of Jonah had to do with the three days in the fish. That's a miracle. That's impossible. That never happens in everyday life. It was a miraculous sign. That's the sign of Jonah. And Jesus was about to die and spend three days in a grave and then come back to life. That's a miracle. That's impossible. That doesn't happen in everyday life. That's the sign that Jesus promised them. He said, you're going to see a sign. It's the sign of Jonah. And it was a promise that he would die and he would be in the grave and he would rise again after three days. Friends, God has given us the same sign today. In fact, uh, my story of faith and surrender pivots around this reality. And and I've told it before, but uh, when I was in high school and started to ask the questions of, do I believe this? Do I believe what I believe because it's true or because I just, this is just the house I was born in? Do I really believe in God? And I started picking at the edges and I started looking under the rocks a little bit and asking why I believe what I believe. I kept bumping into this reality of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And I couldn't get around the evidence that supported it. That all of those followers, nearly all of them, went to their death Defending that Jesus really was alive. All they had to do was say that he actually, it was, it, was, it was a lie. We just pretended. That's all they had to do. And they could have lived, but they went to their death defending that Jesus rose from the dead. And the evidence pointed to me again and again that there's something significant here. And it brought me to a place where I still needed faith, but it wasn't a blind leap of faith. And I placed my, my life in the hands of God. And I said, Lord, I'll follow you all my days. And the reason I did that and in the, in, in the, in the, the journey of me in, in my life of, of growing faith and doing that had to do, and it revolved around the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. I was asking personally, is there a God? What has God done? How can I be sure? The death and resurrection of Jesus answers those questions for me. And so I believed. And when I believed, I surrendered my life to Christ. I realized I didn't need more evidence. I still had a ton of questions. 
I still had a lot of questions that didn't have, all have answers, but I didn't need more evidence to believe. I just needed to believe the evidence I already had. But the pin that holds all of that together is the sign of Jonah, is Jesus' resurrection. And the thing about the story of Jonah, if we go back to the story of Jonah, is that Jonah's sermon was one of the worst sermons ever preached. It was just a really lame sermon. Um, Here it is, Jonah 3, verse 4. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. That's all he says. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then verse 5 says, And the people of Nineveh believed God. That's all they got. But they believed God. They repented and they believed God with not a whole lot to go on. That's what Jesus brings up to these people that are all about the drama and the division and the gathering and the opposing. That's the Jonah connection and how Nineveh believed. Similar to the way that the queen of the south believed God because of Solomon. Verse 31, uh, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. If you wanted to go back and read about Jonah, you just look up in your table of contents, Jonah, and look at the, just read the book of Jonah. It's pretty short. If you want to read about this, the story of of the, the queen of the south is in 1 Kings 10, the queen of Sheba, visiting King Solomon. Uh, from ancient times until today, Solomon has, has been considered the wealthiest and the wisest of all kings ever. The queen had heard this, and so she traveled to Israel and met him. And after her visit, she said this, I did not believe, this is in 1 Kings 10, I did not believe the reports. You hear this theme of believe. What, what does it take to believe? I did not believe the reports until I came And my own eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpass the report that I heard. Blessed be the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Here's a woman who desperately wanted to know the truth. In verse 31, it says that she came from the ends of the earth to find it. And because she was seeking the truth sincerely, she found it. Jesus, in talking about this, humble and gentle and meek as he was, spoke the truth. Someone greater than Solomon is here with you. More powerful, wiser, wealthier. And in contrast to the queen, the people then had a greater truth in front of them. And they missed it. That's when Jesus sort of summarizes his teaching. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment and with this generation um, and condemn it for they repented repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus, greater than Jonah, greater than Solomon and historical evidence has endured to this day. People try to tear Tear apart Christianity and the Bible and the reliability of faith in Christ over and over and over again, and it stands again and again and again. So how is our encouragement, what is our encouragement from these verses? Here's here's just how I would say it, really simply. Uh, Seek the sun, not a sign. Every generation has a broken tendency to seek a sign instead of the sun. To get distracted and to miss Jesus. In contrast, our encouragement is to seek the sun, not a sign. What could that be today? In in Jesus' time in his earthly ministry, 
it, they were looking for more, more spectacular. I don't know if they wanted to see the Red Sea part or a cloud, you know, a fire descend or manna or whatever it was. They wanted more. And it was pretty spectacular what Jesus was showing them, but they wanted more. And I was wondering today, we have God's word so readily. We have the evidence of a risen Christ. We have transformation in the lives of other people. What is it today that people could be kind of wondering or wanting, like, I want more, and it's causing them to not place their life uh, in the hands of God to surrender their lives to Christ? A couple of contemporary examples come to mind. Could it be that we literally want more proof of God still? More questions answered. Our questions are holding us back from truly having faith in God. You know, 2,000 years have passed. It's a long time between then and now. Um, They say there was an empty tomb. How can we be sure? We're not only separated by time, we're separated by distance. We don't live in Israel. I'm not too familiar with what all that looks like. And if Jesus transforms lives so powerfully, how come we don't see more transformation? I mean, how come there's such a thing is a Christian who's a jerk. Why is that a thing? And if God is so powerful and so loving, why is there such a thing as, as really awful things happening and people doing really bad stuff? And so those are legitimate concerns, and people will have those concerns. And I would encourage you to ask all of those questions. Dig. Put it before the Lord. Put it out there. But I would also encourage us that the evidence is reliable and significant and and it takes faith, but it's not a blind leap of faith. Believe in Jesus. Place your trust in him. Believe him. There is enough evidence to believe him. Continue to ask your questions, but move forward. So maybe one of the signs, maybe one of the, the barriers is that there's still questions. We don't feel like until maybe every question gets answered that we can move forward in faith with Christ. Maybe that's one thought. Here's another kind of like what a sign is today. What are we asking for more of that we don't have enough of in God right now? I think we can just get distracted and miss Jesus. And this example might hit a little closer to home for a lot of people these days. So process this with me here a little bit. Could it be that our unquenchable thirst for news and information makes us so angry and anxious and wanting like a political savior kind of a thing that we begin to drift from the priority of Jesus and seeking his presence? Let me ask that again. Could it be that our unquenchable thirst for news and information stirs up so much anger and anxiety in us wanting a political solution, even kind of a political savior, that we begin to drift from the priority of King Jesus and seeking his presence? Now listen to me. I think it's responsible to keep track of news and to vote our convictions and and to live that out. I think that's responsible. But it's a distraction at best and maybe even false religion at worst to expect a political savior. On one side, I think that's how some have viewed former President Trump. On the other side, I think that's how some have viewed current President Biden. And I believe that Jesus is saying to his followers then and to us today, and this is like a loose paraphrase, but I believe Jesus is saying, save the drama for your mama. (laughs) I just think he's saying, let it go. Yeah, follow what's happening, pray about it, care about it. I mean, invest, you know, time. Try and make good decisions. But seek Jesus. Don't seek all the distracting solutions. Seek Jesus. Seek the Son, not a sign.
Do we hunger for the wrong thing? Our broken tendency is toward drama and distrust and distraction, but Jesus calls us to be better than that, to seek him, to trust him. And I believe that a church and a community that does that will stand out in this world as we put Christ first. And Jesus confirms that when he calms our souls. He says, come to me all you who are, her, who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest for your souls. So let's be a people who don't get distracted that way. Let's seek the sun, not a sign. The teaching of Jesus continues into the next uh, portion, Luke eleven thirty three to 36. Listen to this again. I just want to read it again, these uh, four verses. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Jesus talking about light and darkness. Before George Lucas ever gave the fictional world of Star Wars and the Force and the, the dark side of the Force, Jesus used the images and the realities of light and and darkness in his teaching all the time. In fact, uh, light, he uses light in a number of different ways. And so you have to be a little bit careful. Sometimes Jesus is the light. Sometimes we are the light. And so what is the light in this passage? Um, just to cut through the confusion, because I think, honestly, I thought, oh, I, I know what these verses are talking about. And then I reread them and I was like, oh, I, I totally don't know what these verses are talking about. Verses 33 to 36, kind of digging in a little bit. It's a, the verses, I think, are just a little bit confusing uh, when you first run through them. So just to kind of cut through the confusion, I believe in this analogy, Jesus is the light. He just said in verse um, 32 that someone greater than Jonah is here. He's referring to himself. And he just pivots and... All he does in verse 33 is shift the comparison. Jesus is the light on a lampstand for all to see. I think that's pretty clear. To this day, Jesus' gospel is proclaimed all over the world. It is like a lamp blazing from a lighthouse. It shines for all to see. So the light is Jesus, but our eyes and our bodies are like the lamp or a lamp shade. Uh, as I was preparing this message, I was sitting in a chair in my home, and to the left of me is a lamp with a lampshade, and the lamp was turned off. And I kind of looked at the lamp, and I made some observations of what I saw in the lampshade. It was kind of dark. It was dull. It was unhelpful. And I set my notes down, and I stood up, and I went over there, and I turned the little light on. The light bulb turned on. And I sat back down, looked at the same same lamp, but the same lampshade again, and just made some observations. I could see the texture of the lampshade now. It was kind of, it's kind of a canvassy, burlappy kind of a lampshade, and I could see the way the, the kind of the weave of the, of the lampshade came together. Uh, it, be, it was no longer dull and unuseful. It was beneficial in the room. It lightened up the room. The lampshade didn't change inherently. It was still the same lampshade. But the light within it did. It is like that in our own bodies and souls when it comes to what we dwell upon. I think it's true physically as we take in, just talking about what you take in, right? News and TV and media. Um, but I think it's true spiritually as we dwell on the light of Jesus. His love. We dwell in the darkness of sin and our shame. Here's a quote from that Philip Reichen guy I was talking about. When the eyes of the soul are clear, we are able to see the light of Jesus Christ shining in the gospel. We perceive that he really is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. 
we see the cross and the empty tomb, the sign for all times. We believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross and rose again to give us eternal life. The love of Christ shines brightly in our hearts and we start walking in the light of his love. But when our spiritual eyes are bad, when they are covered with the cataract of unrepentant sin or blinded by the skeptical demand for more and more evidence, then we cannot see Jesus as our Savior. The problem is that we do not have enough light as if God needed to give us a more brilliant sign. No. God has given us enough light in his gospel. The problem is that we cannot see it because our hearts are still in darkness. When Jesus said these words, he was speaking to people that were following him. These words are to religious people. These words are to people that go to church and that are around the light of Christ. Like a lamp with the good light bulb switched off. The way forward into the light is a humble heart. Last week we looked at the idea of prayer and Jesus saying, listen, all the answers to your prayer, asking, seeking, and knocking, it's the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is humble ourselves and ask and seek and knock. So here's how I would sum up this text and getting near the end of our time together right now. This is how I would sum it up. This is the Josh Reese vernacular version of what these verses are saying. Flip the humility switch within and ask for help to see the light. Flip the humility switch within and ask for help to see the light. Um, I'm working right now to repair some hurt in my life because I think there was pride and there was arrogance in me in some interactions in the past. And I just realized I just need to flip the humble switch, man. I just need a massive dose of humility. Um, I'm just realizing that in my own life. And I believe that Jesus is saying here, be humble. Be careful about what you see. I thought about the, the line to summarize all of this with the little kids uh, line of the song, oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. For the Father up above, he is looking down in love. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Um, but I think as much as our eyes, this has to do with something inside of us. It has to do with a humility and a willingness to let God shape us. So if we pray, if we ask, if we seek, if we knock, we will receive the help of the Holy Spirit. Flip the humility switch within and ask for help to see the light. Seek the sun, not a sign. Embrace some humility and ask for help. Um, I just want to close by kind of thinking about who's here. So who's here? What kind of age range is here? Well, there's youth and there's students. Um, as I was growing up, I was around people that gave me an example of young kids seeking Jesus that were in their teens. And uh, it's not too early. It's not like this has to be over your head at all. Um, you can seek the Lord. You can have a humble heart and seek him. I think of maybe young adults and, and young singles and kind of wondering what's next in life. Um, there is light that comes through relationship with Christ that fills up who you are, whether you're married or not whether you're in a place of being in a relationship or not, whether that's something you think about, long for, Jesus is what fills us from the inside out. I think of parents. I even think of grandparents. Um, and the influence that we can have, the way that it's the same body, it's the same, like, the same person, but when that light of Christ is flipped on inside of you, that lampshade glows. And our kids and our grandkids see a texture in us that isn't perfect, but they see Jesus coming through. And I just, it's never too late. It's never too early. 
And it's never too late. Let's be a community that seeks Jesus together, that puts his presence as the most important thing that we seek in our lives. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I just really, really want to be a people that have our priorities right. We are flawed. We are hurting. We are broken. We even choose sometimes to go in the opposite direction of you. Please forgive us and help us to get our priorities right. Give us wisdom in this wacky world, this wacky time. So much different information coming at us. And just help us to see it all and sift it all with your wisdom, your discernment, and to prioritize Jesus. To really, to be amazed at the strength and the freedom and the love he offers in faith. Um, Lord, may we as a people then Uh, reorient our lives consistently into um, your priorities, your ways, your best, and send us into this world shining who you are for those around us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, let's stand. Sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained.
like a perfect song. Perfect song to end with. Receive this benediction as you go into the week. Reminder of uh, benevolence, worship through giving, um, any ways you can serve and, and be a part and connect in this community. Take those opportunities as the Lord's, Lord leads. But at the end of Hebrews, here's a benediction for us today. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you this week.